Welcome back to this instantiation of the Computer Science Club uh, in our sort of agenda of five lectures. So now we continue with lecture number three, as in we actually learn to divide polynomials fast, as in computing quotients and remainders. And also we look at batch evaluation and interpolation, how to do those things in, in nearly near time. Okay, just to, to recap the last lecture, what did we learn? Uh, we basically learned the uh, fundamentally important evaluation interpolation duality of, of polynomials. Also the fact that if you look at uh, multiplication in the dual, so it's actually just a pointwise product, so transforming between the primal and the dual representations is, is extremely important. And we learned how to do that actually using primitive roots of unity, assuming they are available in the underlying ring. So then we can do a discrete Fourier transform and actually execute it fast using the fast Fourier transform. And uh, then we looked at some more advanced material that actually enables us to access rings where sort of suitable roots of unity do not necessarily exist. Okay, so we basically today take this uh, as a given that we can multiply fast and then start dividing. So, so basically what our goal is in terms of the first four lectures is that we really want to develop the fast uh, or nearly now time toolbox for computing with univariate polynomials. So as you can see, so in lecture three we have quite a bit of agenda ahead of us. So basically we learn to divide, learn to do fast batch evaluation and learn how to interpolate. <coughs> then uh, in the subsequent uh, lecture what I want to do is uh, then go through the extended Euclidean algorithm, how to compute that in nearly now time, possibly glossing over some parts of the sort of proof. Uh, uh, all of these things are in the slides in detail, so you can of course consult them, them offline, so the slides should be now available uh, online. <coughs> and then finally we actually look at something that's not covered by the sort of reference textbook that I'm using here, namely fast uh, decoding of, of Reed solomon uh, codes, basically. So if you will interpolation from data that is not completely correct. So there may be some errors and you still need to interpolate a low degree polynomial. So we see how to do, do this fast. Uh, uh, in this case, I'm, yes? Is it chapter five or some other book? Uh, no, this is basically a paper uh, in a collection of, of papers, if you will. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's published in book form, indeed. But this is not available, I mean, this uh, Reed solomon decoding algorithm in the textbook. So there you actually have to either consult the slides that should contain actually a self-contained uh, correctness proof following essentially what's in, in, in GAL paper. But if you, of course, want to see the original reference, then you actually have to, have to look at the, the paper. Everything else actually you can find finding the textbook in, in reasonable form. Thanks, that's a, that's a good question. And I mean, please do interrupt me in case you have, have questions. Okay, but that's the agenda. And again, in terms of trimming so that we have time for a lunch break. So I recommend that we sort of uh, gloss over some of the correctness proofs and whatnot in lecture four. But uh, for this lecture, I sort of want to go uh, in detail so that we actually understand what's going on and really, really believe what, uh, what takes place. Okay, good. So, so what's the content uh, for today? Um, so indeed we learn how to, how to divide. And of course, I mean, we have a hammer. We know how to multiply fast. So somehow what needs to take place is that we want to reduce the act of uh, dividing two polynomials, namely computing the quotient and the remainder, into the act of multiplying somehow. And uh, yeah, there's a wonderful trick basically that we we sort of reverse things. I mean, the, the first time you see this, you will not believe that it actually works. It seems so ad hoc, but, but that's the idea. So once we have sort of reversed the division identity in an appropriate manner, so then we can actually design a Newton iteration to, to compute the uh, multiplicative inverse of the reverse modulo uh, a polynomial. And, and then that is basically the, the hammer we we keep using because then this Newton iteration actually it's it's all about multiplying things and uh, and we see that because sort of we get a geometric increase in accuracy in the Newton iteration so this enables us to to actually multiply uh, sorry divide in multiplication time so so the only thing you you sort of lose in is in terms of the constants 
that you get. But asymptotically sort of division runs just as fast as multiplication, which is uh, very satisfactory, of course. And of course, we need to analyze convergence in that case, so we get a little bit of uh, iterative algorithms toolbox uh, at the same time. Um, usually when I teach this uh, material, I also do integer division. So to, to see these two algorithms in parallel to each other is, is a highly instructive exercise, but unfortunately today we don't have uh, this time. So, so we, we need to trim a little bit so we only look at polynomials and don't, don't look at the integer division case. Once we're done with that, so then we have two hammers. So, so we actually can multiply fast and we can divide fast. So then uh, we'd better sort of put the fast division into, into use. And this is what we will do. Basically, we get fast batch evaluation. So basically at any points that we would like to choose, we, we can evaluate in here nearly that time in the number of points and in the degree of the, of the input polynomial. And this is courtesy of uh, fast division. If you think about the FFT, so there you get fast evaluation at very specific points. Whereas in here, we can actually choose our points as we like. Similarly, so we can interpolate from values at distinct points. We can actually recover, recover the relevant polynomial, assuming, of course, certain invertibility things. And here the key workhorse is basically that we make use of a wonderful combinatorial object, namely a perfect binary tree. And we sort of go up and down the tree and sort of do some products and uh, get things uh, done that way. Okay, but this is sort of roughly the agenda for, for the for the lecture number three, so let's uh, get on ongoing. So, and then again, if you want to consult the textbook, here are the relevant uh, parts of the book. So this is essentially, I mean, almost from, uh, directly from the book, not quite. I sort of maybe use a little bit different notation, but again, you can rely on the book if you want to. Okay, so let's just first uh, sort of set up an agenda so we recall what is polynomial division the division identity if you will in terms of quotient and remainder then let's set up basic notation for basically the complexity of multiplication just to recall what we did yesterday very quickly and then uh, really i mean as per our agenda we want to divide as fast as we can multiply asymptotically so the only place where we lose is in the in the constants and, and indeed the workhorse is to is to proceed by reduction to multiplication, as I said. Okay, so, so here basically, just to recall, we are working over a ring R uh, for our coefficients. The rings are commutative and non-trivial, so zero doesn't equal one. So if I have two polynomials, namely uh, the dividend uh, of degree n and the divisor of degree m, such that the divisor is a monic polynomial, so the leading coefficient is a one, then we can always divide, so the quotient and the remainder exist, and they are unique, so that's a neat little exercise to, to verify in this case. And let's recall in particular the division identity, so the uh, dividend uh, equals the quotient times the divisor plus the remainder, and the remainder is constrained to be in degree strictly less than the degree of the divisor. And that's basically it, so this much we already did yesterday, as a primer, here is the classical division algorithm. And of course, now the motivation is, could we do better than this? Because this is a quadratic time, time thing. Now we want to go to near linear time. And the hammer we have is fast polynomial multiplication. So uh, let's just recall what's going on in terms of polynomial multiplication. Uh, so again, we have a coefficient ring two polynomials given to us as input, and now let's assume they're both uh, bounded from above in degree by, by the parameter d. So uh, then we can actually, courtesy of yesterday, compute the product f times g in coefficient representation uh, in sort of asymptotically the multiplication time operations. So in what follows, basically function capital M measures the multiplication time for polynomials. So again, if the ring R is actually endowed with a good primitive root of unity to support multiplication up to up to degree D. Sorry, so yes. M, M is constant or? Uh, well, M is a function that we will not specify in oh. detail. So, so M is a function of the degree D. So for example, I mean, if I want to multiply two polynomials of degree oh, okay. at most D, so then the complexity is, I mean, I will not specify these functions in in detail as usual. So it's just sort of given that m is some, some function that grows at most at this rate. Second, 
bullet is a definition. Uh, or if you will, it's just sort of uh, stating a fact mm -hmm. that we can multiply in, in this many operations and then it really depends on the ring as to exactly what this uh, sort of uh, gets grounded down to. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I'm working over the complex field, then I certainly have always good primitive roots of unity. So this is in terms of the arithmetic complexity, uh, the number of arithmetic operations that suffice to multiply. Okay, very good question, thanks. And more generally, we can actually, for any ring, we can take this uh, sort of schoenhage strassen like running time. So essentially, I mean, the, the moral of the story that if you see m of d, so it's a near linear function in this sense. Okay. So, and again, sort of, this just goes back to lecture two that we already did. So this is our hammer. Now we need to put it to use. And it seems that somebody else is also sort of doing some renovation here. So I hope that in terms of the audio, we are still in, in reasonable shape. Okay, so let's first try to simplify the task a little bit. So, so how does division look if we view it from 36,000 feet? Sort of really forgetting all the, all the details. So, so given A and B, we need to compute the quotient and the remainder that something like this holds. And let's not worry about the degrees or, or anything at this point. So, of course, the moral of the story is that we, we have a hammer. We can multiply fast. So we should sort of discount all, all multiplications and additions of polynomials as, as easy stuff. So then, I mean, a simple observation is that if we have access to Q, so if we can compute the quotient, then if you look at how we get the remainder courtesy of the identity, so it's uh, basically a multiplication and a subtraction that we need to do. So all we really need to do is to get the quotient and then we are done. Because this, I mean, is, is easy. Courtesy of our access to fast multiplication. Okay, so that at least simplifies things a little bit. <clears throat> so let's then sort of set up the agenda what we want to do. We want to recover the quotient Q from the given A and B actually by iterative means. So that we start with a very rough approximation for the, for the quotient and then we run an iteration presumably based on on multiplication that, that helps us to eventually get uh, sufficient accuracy. Of course, I haven't defined what accuracy means. It, it could mean different things. For example, in the case of integer division, it would be something different from, from polynomial division. But here, actually, think of the accuracy that we sort of get better and better approximations in terms of getting more and more uh, monomials right. And that would be sort of what you want to, want to do. And furthermore, so, so remember that uh, what we want to do is we really want to reach uh, multiplication time asymptotically. So we only want to lose in the constants. So typically, if you want to uh, design such an algorithm that actually achieves this, it's a good idea to somehow set up the iteration in such a way that you get a geometric increase in accuracy. So at every iteration, I mean, but at every run of the iteration, uh, <coughs> you increase the accuracy from, let's say, n to 2n. And then of course you get a geometric progression and then hopefully we can sort of discount things uh, so that we in the end get sort of only a loss in the constants in terms of the running time. <clears throat> and here of course the idea is that you keep sort of running the iteration until you have a sufficiently accurate version of, of the quotient and then we are, we are happy. Okay, so and again, of course, uh, each iteration hopefully then will involve a constant number of multiplications, additions, and subtractions on, on inputs of size order n. And of course, this is again somehow related to the degree of the polynomials. For integers, it would be, let's say, related to the bit complexity. But again, we are not considering integers for uh, purposes of compressing the material. But the same agenda would apply in other contexts. That's why I want to sort of give first a high level view what we want to do, and then really look at the details, how to, how to get going. Okay, so we want to iterate for the quotient. So let's, uh, let's first verify just with a simple lemma that actually this type of an agenda will, will sort of get us, get us where we want to be, and then actually look at the details in the case of polynomials. So, <clears throat> so here is basically a simple lemma that I leave as an exercise that sort of uh, tells us that this type of a geometric iteration 
makes sense. So again, suppose you have a time complexity function t in such a way, for example, let's say it's a function of, of this form or this form. So I say that it grows at least literally, uh, at least linearly, linearly sorry, uh, if for all triples of integers such that n is the sum of n1 and n2, actually we have the following identity. And if you think about, so, so that's intuitively what, what one would get if, if actually you have at least linear growth. So, so basically that's, that's what we would, uh, or that's what we are going to be using. And of course, if you think about it, so this is slightly superlinear growth, and this is a, maybe a little bit stronger growth, but still sort of in morale, uh, <clears throat> quite close to linear. Okay. And then if we have such a function that grows at least linearly, again, you can of course substitute your favorite polynomial function here, let's say quadratic growth, so you similarly get that, get that it sort of obeys this, this form of an uh, inequality. So then, if we run an iteration that somehow keeps doubling values of, I mean, input sizes for, for this function, so then this sort of behaves nicely because you can discount all the preceding steps, basically the sum of all the, all the work that you did in the, let's say, k preceding steps if you start at some initial value k0 with the work that you do, you do at the last step, essentially. So, so this is somehow the, if you want the discounting mechanism that we use to, to actually get to multiplication time, uh, up to constants, again. Because the earlier steps of the iteration work with much lower accuracy and you double the accuracy at every step, so this is why, why we're sort of uh, in good shape. Okay, so in a sense this is why we want geometric progression out of the out of the iteration, that you double the accuracy at every step. Of course, it doesn't matter that you double at every step, but you need to multiply with a, with a constant for this type of a scheme to work. <clears throat> okay, good. So, so what should be now our goal? So let's uh, state it again, that we really want to reach asymptotically multiplication time. So basically R is a ring, and our given inputs are polynomials with coefficients in the ring. B is a monic polynomial, again the leading coefficient needs to be a 1. And both of them are bounded in degree, let's say, by a parameter d. Again, of course, for division to have a non-trivial result, we have to have the d degree of the dividend uh, is at least the degree of the divisor. Otherwise, uh, of course, you have a simple... And what we want now is an algorithm that computes both the quotient and the remainder in the sort of division identity. Uh, in multiplication time in the parameter d. That's what we want. And of course, then the multiplication time depends on the ring, but we can certainly always take such a function there. Okay, that's the goal. So let's see whether we, we get there. Yes? Uh, then, of course, the leading coefficient, uh, if it's not a unit and we are over an arbitrary ring, then we might be in trouble. But let's say, again, if you work over a field, so then, of course, you can first make it a monic polynomial and then run the algorithm and then return sort of to the non-monic situation. Very good question. But again, remember a ring may be that, this may be a matrix ring, for example. <laughs> and then it's not at all clear whether you have multiplicative inverses. Uh, so, so rings are very generic objects. So you should appreciate somehow also the generality of this framework. But this sort of just uh, makes sure that we are well set to do things. And, and we will see basically where we use this monic assumption in the subsequent algorithm as well. So a very good question. Sir, do you remember monic? Monic. Uh, leading coefficient is a one. So the multiplicative identity of the ring. So polynomial with leading coefficient one. Yes, we will see this. I mean, it's part of the algorithm. That yeah. So again, you should appreciate the generality. Yes. Uh, of course. Yes. I always assume that rings are commutative and non-trivial. So zero must not equal one. These were sort of given already in the previous lectures, but thanks, I mean, yeah. Otherwise, of course, if the ring would be non-commutative, then we would be in a world of trouble, so 
yeah, we don't want to get there. So rings are commutative as per our assumption. So thanks. <clears throat> okay, good. Um, so now let's uh, let's look at the trick. What we are going to do, and now you should pay attention. So this is uh, important. Okay, so here is our our polynomial f, uh, and it may have degree up to up to n. So some of the coefficients may be zero in the sequence. But let's define for an integer parameter n the n reversal of the polynomial. It's uh, written like this so that re we remember basically what the uh, parameter for the reversal is because we can take n to be a larger basically value than the degree of the polynomial. Then we just pad, pad with zeros if that is the case. Okay, so, so what is the n reversal of f? Well, if we view actually the polynomial as a sequence of coefficients, we do nothing but we reverse that sequence. I mean, basically, the sort of here the highest coefficient becomes the lowest and, and so forth. I mean, you, you really just reverse the sequence. Uh, but you may have here a suffix of zero. So again, just to, to point that out. Okay, and now somehow the dirty trick uh, surfaces. So let's study the division identity, or if you will, the quotient remainder identity. With, of course, the, the usual parameterization, because again, the result of the division is trivial unless this inequality holds. So now we fix the degrees, so the degree of the dividend is n, and the divisor uh, is uh, m. And then, of course, we know that the degree of the remainder is bounded uh, from above by, by m minus 1. So the reversal operation, if we apply it uh, diligently, so now we really carefully need to actually use these precise values for the reversal, it sort of uh, leads to a rather nice form. So again, this is something that I leave for the problem set. So you need to convince yourself, uh, sort of in an offline situation, that this actually holds. But notice that uh, can sort of rather nicely if I just pay attention to the uh, sort of reversal parameters. So I can reverse the quotient, I can reverse the divisor, and then the remainder gets conveniently shifted up by this many positions. This monomial means that I just shift up the sequence by basically n minus n plus one, one positions. And then I get the reverse of the remainder. But remember what we sort of had in our agenda, that uh, what we want to have is some way of recovering the quotient. And we really don't want to pay too much attention on the, on the remainder, if possible, somehow, because that we can get later. So all we need is the quotient. So yesterday we saw actually that I can sort of do, of course, modular arithmetic with polynomials. So, so now if I mod out with respect to the ideal generated by this monomial, I have something that looks awfully nice. So basically what this means is that, I mean, I just set all the uh, monomials of at least this degree to zero. That's, that's what the modular arithmetic does. So it's nothing more fancy. So I really cut sort of the polynomials from this degree. So everything just, so you cut the sequence, if you will. So that's what it means notational. <clears throat> um, okay, but, but this is awfully nice. I mean, so if you think about, so, so maybe we have access to the reverse of the quotient in this way. Yes. Yeah, well, if you will, yeah, yeah. It's uh, but it looks like a trick that shouldn't work. But believe me, it works. I mean, that's. Uh, but you need to prove this for yourself to really believe that it works. That's why I really leave it for the problem set. I, I don't want to. Yes. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, if you want. Yeah, what? Uh, I, I just sort of want you to prove it for yourself that you really believe that it works. So yeah, it, it's not a difficult proof, of course. <laughs> okay. Now, um, so so now actually, of course, if we have access to the reverse of the quotient, then reversing it again gives you the quotient. So we really, I mean, it suffices to solve for this. And if you think about it, so what we want to actually Recover, I mean, assuming this reverse of the divisor actually has a multiplicative inverse modulo this ideal, 
then we are done. If we can compute actually the multiplicative inverse of this, because then all we need to do is, is to multiply with the inverse on both sides. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. And then we are in good shape. And now, uh, actually, since B is a monic polynomial, now if you think about, so the leading coefficient is a one, so when we reverse it, it becomes the constant. So here the constant, or if you will, the degree zero coefficient is a one. And then actually this is sufficient for, for us to have a multiplicative inverse modulo, modulo that. And, and we will see that this is actually the case through the Newton iteration whose correctness we prove. You can also prove it separately if you want, but I mean, it's a good exercise as well, but uh, we'll get it, I mean, as part of the, the agenda. So here is really the roadmap. So we want to recover the quotient, so let's first uh, recover the reverse of the quotient and then we can just reverse and, and we have the quotient. And once we have the quotient, we get the remainder just by plugging into the, into the division identity. So, so this is really the key trick that you do. Again, for integer division, this would be uh, somewhat different, but uh, so there you don't reverse, you do something completely different actually, but still the morale of the story in terms of how you recover then, then the quotient is, uh, is somewhat similar. But for polynomials, this is actually maybe a little bit simpler once you sort of believe that this holds. But again, it's an easy proof, but I want to do it, uh, you to do it for yourself. I don't want to give it here. Okay. So, yes. So, can you tell, so, in a sense, what we find is, like, it's not, it's not the question, but the question of what you, uh, blah, 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 this. Uh, yes, you but. Uh, of the module is large enough, in a sense. So yes, yeah. It's large enough that you get the quotient always, if you think about how the degree of the quotient must be right. in division. So, this is just, I mean, you cut at one above the degree of the quotient, so it just works. So, so we use this module just to cut the, the remainder? Uh, yeah, the remainder out, basically, yeah, if you want, yeah. Okay, but let's uh, maybe see how we actually get the... So, we, how we always find this reverse B? <laughs> it's multiplicative inverse. Of course, reverse B is easy to find. Oh, okay. That's just a reversal. Yeah, yeah. You multiply with the inverse of this guy modulo the modulus, and then I'm about to show you how to find it fast. And, uh, and did, did, did I understand correctly that, it, uh, that you are going to prove that uh, that it has a multiplicative? Yes, uh -huh. as part of the sort of uh, Newton iteration that we will derive. Mm -hmm. So yes, you are absolutely correct. So it is to follow. All right, so let's just look at an example just that we understand. Okay, maybe this is clear enough so we don't need to look at it too much. So here are my sort of uh, dividend and divisor, if you want. And then I mean, we carefully look at the degrees. Okay, so here actually are the quotient and the remainder. So we, of course, shouldn't know this yet, but I'm <laughs> just to, if you want to compute the relevant reverses, so there they are. And uh, here we can actually check that the identity holds, but again, I mean, it's, it's just an individual example. So let's, uh, let's actually look at how we compute, compute the multiplicative inverse, and this also proves that it exists. So this is maybe uh, the most important slide uh, when it comes to division. It's, it's fully packed with uh, data, but let's go through it slowly. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but this is just an individual case uh, that we see that these things actually actually hold. So yeah, so we have the reversals here. So you do nothing but you actually reverse this the sequence exactly, and uh, the same for the divisor. So you reverse the sequence and. Uh, of course, these we do not know yet. They're just yeah. given there. See how reversal operates. Basically, so that the, the subscript of the reversal function is, is always just a degree of the corresponding. Uh, no, not necessarily. For example, for the remainder, the remainder may be, for example, zero. Oh, yeah. 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 So it, it really matters. So that's why I'm giving this. Yeah. 
explicitly. And, and this is just like uh, the maximum. Yeah. Yeah. Like indeed. Involved. Yeah. 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 Of course, here it holds exactly because yeah. I mean n was precisely the degree of a, m was precisely the degree of yeah. b, and actually this is precisely the degree of the quotient. But for the remainder, you need to be a little bit right. careful, so that's why it, the parameter is there. Yeah, again, a very good question. And on the next line, we just see that the reversal, how it, how it, that at least in this case, the identity holds. But then. Yeah, you want to prove that the general case works as well. Of course, here the remainder is sort of has actually full degree, but of course it could be zero if it's an exact division. So, so this is a sort of not a representative example in general. But okay, but now let's get to the real meat of the matter. So how do we design a Newton iteration? And uh, the iteration itself actually comes a bit like uh, from let's say blue sky, but uh, Actually, if we were to study the integer case, so then we would see actually how, how this arises. But let's see what, what we are doing here. So we want to compute multiplicative inverses modulo x to the d. So if you want, d is the, d is the modulus degree at which we cut to zero. Um, and if you remember, so what we get as input is basically the reverse of the divisor and the divisor was a monic polynomial. So remember the leading coefficient in the divisor was a one. So now we have reversed it. So this means that the constant is a one in the polynomial. So the degree zero coefficient is one. Okay. Now what we are supposed to do is, is actually to give an iteration that gives us this inverse and also shows that it exists. So we do two things simultaneously. So it's all in this one slide. So again, it's very important to pay attention. Okay, and the idea is that we sort of set up an iteration that doubles d at every step intuitively. In, in reality, we actually use uh, basically d is going to be of the form two to the k, and then any large enough two to the k is good enough for us because I mean, essentially what this modulus does, of course, it just cuts the result. So if the result is, sort of good for a higher modulus, so then we are in good shape. Okay, so we sort of do simultaneously an inductive proof and then sort of give the algorithm that does this thing. So let's assume initially that, I mean, for the inductive uh, um, sort of, what is the claim that we want to prove by induction is that there is an F that is an inverse in the following sense, that F times G, the thing that we actually want to invert, is the identity. I mean, namely that this is actually a multiplicative inverse modulo x to the 2 to the k for some non-negative integer k. Okay, so let's set up the base case that at least we know that it holds for k equals 0. Okay, so if we take f equals 1, and if you think about it, so what is 2 to the 0? It's 1. So this modulus then cuts everything above the constant term. It sets to 0. So all we need to worry about is that in the base case that one times one equals one. And this is of course what we have. So one, and if we cut the G polynomial into the constant, so it's a one, so one times one equals one. We are happy, so the induction base is sound. But now of course we need uh, some kind of way of actually evolving the inverse from an initial assumption. Okay, so suppose now that we actually have an F that is good for some parameter value k. We want to prove that things hold for k plus one. So, so here is somehow, okay, we, we compute this, this quantity and then I claim that f hat actually is good for our purposes. So, so where this comes from is sort of, uh, you, you want to look at it maybe in the continuous setting and first look at the integer case and then you actually understand why this is a good good choice uh, for a Newton iteration. If you're familiar with Newton iterations in the continuous setting, I encourage you to do this offline, but here let's just uh, verify that this works. So let's see, so maybe just to give a bit of morale, so two minus F times G. And if you look at F times G, so at least up to two to the K, it's going to be a one. So somehow it seems that we are trying to get even closer to to the correct value, that's the, and then you get times f. But notice now that the modulus is one higher, so we need to be a little bit careful in the analysis. And let's also see how we compute this in reality. So, so, so how do we evaluate the right-hand side so that we get f hat? So 
we have f, obviously, from the previous iteration, and we have g. But g may have absolutely massive degree. So we don't want to use the entire g to, to actually get a good iteration. So what we do uh, to... Uh, yes? f has degree uh, the most uh, x to, to the g? Uh, yeah, minus 1. Right. Yeah, degree at most 2 to the k minus 1. Correct? Um, and g, of course, may have massive degree, but we cut g. So we basically cut them all to the degree 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1, if you want, because, of course, everything above is, is 0. So we evaluate this expression basically subject to this, this modulus. And then we first make sure that we cut g, because if we use the entire g in the computation, then we lose. So we have to cut it first. And then use the f that we have, so we execute the computations with sort of this accuracy, and then we get our f hat. Okay, now I should probably, I mean, during the break, so let's adjust the screen saver so that this doesn't happen again. <clears throat> okay, so now, now we, we want to check that uh, the f hat that we just computed is good for parameter value k plus 1. So let's just first uh, observe to analyze this iteration is that because f is good for parameter value k by the inductive assumption, so then actually there is a polynomial h that we do not know that actually has identity here in the sense that this is the part that we cut out. I can express it in this form. Okay, so now let's analyze what is basically f hat times g, because that is what I need to confirm, that f hat times g is actually equal to 1 modulo the higher exponent. And this is what we do. So f hat times g, well, let's plug it in. There it is, I'm, you, you substitute it. Then let's see. So now I'm actually using the, the fun fact that f times g actually is this quantity precisely. So there we are, and now a little bit of elementary algebra. So I have one minus uh, an expression and one plus the same expression. If you think about how it goes, so obviously I get this nicely squared, which is precisely sort of that things get cut out. And I have the next thing in the sequence. And now, of course, I can run the iteration for as many steps as I like, eventually so that 2 to the k is above our cutoff threshold d, and then I'm good. Because then I could just as well cut at d, and of course the identity needs to hold for lower values as well. And now here is where we sort of get the payoff from the geometric progression. Because I mean the precision, of course, I mean the degree goes up by a factor of two in every case. So or in every step of the iteration. So very nicely I in the end get to multiplication time by virtue of the previous lemma that I tried to convince you about. So, so shouldn't we say that the, the cost of step k is, is below of L of 2 to the k plus d because we, we need to uh, uh, yes, but think about how the truncation works. So your polynomial is a sequence of coefficients in random access memory. So you just read a prefix of the polynomial. So you don't get the plus oh. d there. So really, I mean, you cut, remember, what you do is you disregard the polynomial g above a particular degree. A very good question, Sasha. So you're being oh, you very careful. Okay, so you, because x to the k is equal to 0 and not to 1. Yes, exactly. This truncates. Yeah, it, it's not a cyclic convolution like uh, identification. Very good question. Again, this is important for understanding. I'm happy that you are sort of putting fourth good question, so. Okay, but this is the most important slide when it comes to understanding fast division. And actually the integer case is, is not much different, but there you of course need to worry about precision and, and whatnot, so it, it gets a little bit more, uh, more technical, but the Newton iteration actually it sort of looks like this, but then you need to worry about epsilons and whatnot in terms of how, how close you are to to the actual inverse and, and whatnot. So for polynomials, this is very clean. So you, I mean, it's an exact computation. There is. So is it safe? To, it means that it is safe to say that we can divide in exactly the same time as we Yes, but of course, the big O notation here hides a larger coefficient. So if you really want to drill into the details, you see that, of course, the, the coefficient is, is bigger. Yeah, it's a bit larger. 
and it depends of course on the sort of multiplication function as well but but it is sort of uh, if you appeal just to the asymptotic so in terms of big O notation you get the same bound so it's sort of no 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 it's it's manifestly practical so so this is implementable as well I, I forget the precise constants for example what you get out of my humble GPU implementation yeah, we, we can discuss this offline maybe. <clears throat> okay, so, so here is an example how the iteration goes just to sort of uh, show you what's going on. So again, here I want to stress that let's, let's look at the polynomial G. So suppose we want to invert this guy now. I mean, again, notice that the uh, sort of constant is a one here. So this is already the reversed version. And let's say we want to get the inverse uh, modulo x to the seven, okay? Uh, fair enough. Uh, so now let's uh, see how we need to apply the iteration. So the least integer k, I mean, we need to up, run to, uh, up to k equals three. So two to the three is obviously eight. So it's greater than, than six. Sorry, I mean, seven that we wanted. Uh, so here's how the iteration goes. So notice that I am carefully sort of uh, cutting g as I go. So if I don't do the cutting, then obviously I pay the entire penalty every time and this would be really really bad then I actually would not get multiplication time for division but since I'm doing carefully sort of the the cutting to the correct precision so these previous iterations essentially I mean up to constants come for free <laughs> you only pay for the last last round and then I mean you can actually check that this is a multiplicative inverse modulo x to the x to the seven of of this guy I mean, I leave that as an exercise, but, but this is a very neat trick. I mean, Newton iteration is a powerful tool, also with sort of discrete things. I mean, here we are obviously working modulo five in terms of the coefficients, so there's nothing even resembling continuous here, but still Newton iteration uh, runs nicely. Uh, okay. If, if we need to compute the inverse of, uh, of a polynomial whose free coefficient is not one, and if we're working on we just divide by yeah, and, and then you set it up back once you sort of have the have the inverse. So that's uh, also yeah. Okay, good. Um, let me see what I have next. I think I okay. There's an example how we do the division, but I think the steps are clear by now. So you reverse, then you seek for the multiplicative inverse of of the reversal of the divisor that we. See here, here is the, the inverse. So then we actually compute uh, this times uh, the reverse of the divisor to recover the reverse of the, of the quotient. Of course, we need to cut it again. And once we have the reverse of the quotient, we reverse again. So we actually do get the quotient. And then once we have the quotient, so we compute a times, uh, sorry, a minus b times the quotient to, to get the remainder. And there we are, that is the entire division. And notice that the, the only sort of non-trivial computational primitive that we use in the process is fast multiplication. So we are very nicely done because here it's, it's just one multiplication at the end. So, so one should maybe appreciate this I mean, a yeah. little bit. So, so here's the entire summary of the, of the algorithm, how it goes, I mean, in in words, I mean, I don't list the Newton iteration because it was already in the in the previous slide. And uh, again, we can verify that the total complexity really is multiplication time, whatever it happens to be over your chosen chosen ring. And I believe we have gone now for forty three minutes, so it's a good idea to have a break at this point and then continue with the next items in the agenda, namely batch evaluation and interpolation. All right, thanks. Continue shortly. So let's see where we are. We just uh, learned how to divide fast. So, so basically now we have one more hammer in our toolbox. So we can multiply and we can divide. So let's uh, now explore the power of the new tool that we have. Namely, uh, let's go into batch evaluation and interpolation. Again, here are sort of the textbook chapters that you may want to consult and uh, let's recall what is the task in uh, evaluation and what is the task in interpolation. So again, 
in evaluation, you have the polynomial in coefficient representation, and then you have a bunch of points, let's say d plus one points in this case, of course, we could have more or less as well. And really, the I mean, it's a linear task that we need to accomplish in this sense that you need to multiply with the Van der Maan matrix to get the evaluations, and interpolation is, is the other way around. And notice that I'm carefully assuming now that we are over a field, and uh, in interpolation, the coefficient, uh, evaluation points need to be distinct, otherwise we are in, in trouble. So if, if they are not distinct, so then the matrix obviously is not invertible, and we cannot interpolate. Okay. So, so that's the task, and uh, uh, then of course, uh, somehow, I mean, what we asked already during lecture two is, is whether we can go faster than actually explicitly constructing the Van der Maan matrix and, and doing the obvious linear algebra operations there. And in lecture two, we saw that indeed, if we choose the points carefully, then we are in good shape. So we can choose them to be powers of a primitive root of unity, assuming it's sort of exists and assuming the order is appropriately composite, so then we can develop a fast Fourier transform to, to do this. But what about in general? Now that we have these two hammers, so we know how to multiply and divide fast, so maybe we could make use of, use of this newfound uh, ability. So, so in particular, what if I have arbitrary points? And, and suppose furthermore that I'm in a ring. So, so let's up the game a little bit. So this could be a matrix ring or some other sort of... Uh, but again, of course, we have to assume that things are commutative. So that's our assumption. So rings always are commutative and non-trivial. So zero doesn't equal one. Okay, so at that level of generality, so, so let's see. So, and, and we had sort of quotient and remainder already sort of studied to quite some extent. So. A quotient B is the quotient, and A remainder B is the, is the remainder. And again, we made the assumption that we have uh, monic polynomials. Uh, I mean, that they, uh, at least the divisor is, is monic always. Although if it's not, then we need to do a little bit of work. And sometimes uh, division doesn't succeed, of course, if you have a, have a bad ring. Okay, but uh, so now that we know how to divide, so let's uh, develop the technology to do batch evaluation and interpolation. And sort of there are just a few ingredients. So compared with the amount of labor that we had to put uh, to, let's say, first of all, fast multiplication and fast division. So th this is actually, I mean, pleasant, really, really pleasant. So we encounter some of the most wonderful, uh, simple structures in, in computing. If, if you want. So uh, this basically contains more or less uh, all we need for fast, fast evaluation, save for one further sort of standard ingredient, namely the, the perfect binary tree. But okay, let's, let's parse what's going on. So fast batch evaluation by something called recursive remaindering. So we know how to take remainders fast, so let's put this uh, ability to use. And again, I'm leaving a couple of lemmas for you to prove. They are not difficult, so again, a couple of lines of proof. But I want you to do it so that you realize sort of how wonderful this is. And let's set up the stage first. So, so we have a degree d polynomial given to us, or actually degree at most d, if you like. And we want to compute the values at e given points. So the indices range from 0 to, to e minus 1 for convenience. So, and these need not be distinct points, so they can be any points points in the ring, in fact. And what we want is a rather ambitious running time, if you think about it, because naively, of course, we would get multiplicative complexity. So if we actually used Horner's rule, so then it would be order d times e operations that we need. Now notice, I mean, we know that multiplication complexity is near linear, so it's sort of, of course, say for the log terms, I mean, it's, uh, it's fast. And notice we only have additive dependence, not multiplicative here. And so with respect to the input polynomial, we are really at multiplicative complexity. And you pay an extra log factor in terms of the number of points that you evaluate. But think how efficient this is. So I have, a, I don't know, a degree one billion polynomial that I want to evaluate at one billion points of my choice. And you are in business still. Whereas with quadratic complexity, of course, I mean, one billion squared is already a bit scary. So then you don't want to try. But here uh, it's still so potentially doable. Of course, it might take a little bit of time and resources, but, but still, I mean, you are not willing to abandon the idea because you know that it's nearly now. 
Of course, I mean, the logarithms here start uh, mattering if, if you go into larger inputs. So here, for example, the dependence is actually quadratic in the logarithm because you have a hidden logarithm in here, but, but still, I mean, it's, uh, it's still something conceivable. And the multipoint evaluation, we actually start doing remainders. And here are the two, two tricks. So, so how do we actually sort of uh, make the task of evaluating a polynomial into computing a remainder? So, so this is what I recommend you to prove for yourself. Actually, more or less, you, you formulate the re relevant um, division identity, and then you see by substitution that indeed this is the case. So if I want to evaluate a polynomial f at a point xi, what I do, I mean, I can just, of course do the evaluation, or I can actually compute the remainder of f with respect to x minus uh, the chosen point of evaluation. x, of course, being the indeterminate of the polynomial ring, so this is a degree one polynomial. Also observe that it's a monic polynomial. So even if I'm over an arbitrary ring, this works. Again, with the assumption that rings are commutative and non-trivial, of course. So yeah, prove this for yourself. I'm not spoiling the fun for you. It's about two lines, so you can do it over the break. Um, and then, of course, computing loves recursion. Divide and conquer. So, so let's uh, try to parse what the, what the second lemma says. So, I have three polynomials where B and C sort of have the property that they are both monic. And let's also assume that C divides B. So basically B is a multiple of, of C, if you like. So then this little lemma says that if I want to compute uh, the remainder of A with respect to C, then I can do it sort of in stages, because now notice that C divides B, so I can actually first remainder with sort of the larger degree polynomial. And then of course if you think about the result goes down in degree very nicely, so we sort of then the second remaindering we do with respect to a much lower degree polynomial. So this fundamental thing here enables us to save work if we apply it carefully and recursively. And then of course the binary tree comes into into play that. Let's say at the bottom level I want to do something of sort of very low degree and then I remainder it with respect to a very low degree polynomial as well. And somehow we want only to deal with the high degree stuff at the upper stages of a binary tree. And then at the leaves somehow the work needs to be pretty small. But then of course in a binary tree there are lots of leaves, especially if it's a perfect binary tree. But that's the intuition. So all again can be somehow summarized in one slide. Again, this is a few lines of proof. So you just uh, write the relevant uh, division identities and then check that that this holds. So, but again, it's for you to do, not that I want to spell these things out. That would be spoiling the fun. And this is definitely manifestly doable. Okay, so let's sort of uh, try this out with an example and then sort of the general case will be rather blatantly obvious once we see how things go. So let's actually for the fun of it just work with, with integers uh, as a ring. Of course the arithmetic complexity may be, may be large in that case, but uh, oh, sorry I mean the, the bit complexity may be large in that case, but uh, let's not worry about that for the sake of the example. So suppose I want to evaluate this funny polynomial here at the first uh, four non-negative integers. So, so let's try to formulate this uh, recursive remaindering strategy. So, so here are the steps. So indeed, let's take a perfect binary tree. Of course, in general, if I don't have an exact power of two in terms of my points of evaluation, so then let's just pad. I mean, you take a few points so that you get to the next power of two extra. Here we just happen to have exactly four points, so it's a convenient power of two. So let's place these uh, degree one linear polynomials at the leaves. So it's basically all the evaluation points, if you want, formulated as degree one polynomials, because we wanted the values at the integers from zero to, to three. Okay, so now of course we want to do recursive remaindering. So we need to somehow first complete uh, the tree a little bit. So let's annotate it and actually take uh, subproducts if you will. So, so really the rule is that when I'm at a node, 
I just look at basically the immediate children, so there are polynomials there, so let's multiply them and assign that polynomial to this particular node. And follow the strategy across the tree. So basically what you do is a post-order traversal of the tree if you sort of want the standard algorithms class term how, how to do this. And uh, you see, I mean, the, obviously the degrees double as we go up, but the number of nodes that you have gets halved. <laughs> So, I mean, the total complexity, if you will, at each level is somehow order E, in a sense, if you have E points here at the, at the bottom. And of course, we know that the number of levels is, is basically the base two logarithm of, uh, of E uh, plus one. Okay, so, so now we have multiplied things. Uh, so <laughs> somehow all the evaluation points that we would like to, to get are pre-processed. But of course we need to evaluate a particular polynomial. So how does that polynomial come in? So we have the polynomial f that we want to evaluate. Okay, so let's take the next step. So remember this was the guy that we wanted to, to evaluate. So let's uh, just stare at the root node and actually take the remainder of this polynomial with the thing that we associated with the root. So the blue guy. And there is the remainder. Of course, it's one remainder computation. And if we think about it, so, so this is an order E polynomial in terms of degree, and this is order D. So the total cost for this is uh, basically the maximum of the multiplication time uh, of, of D and E, whatever that happens to be. So that's where the multiplication cost for, for D comes in potential. So now we have this remainder and we have the wonderful recursive remaindering technique. So because if you think about this tree has been carefully constructed in such a way that whenever I go down, I get divisibility. So for example, this guy here happens to divide this polynomial and similarly, I mean, this, I mean whenever you go up the tree, you, you have divisibility. So I can quite literally propagate the remainders down again. So let's, let's do that. So here is the sort of propagation completely. Yes. Here. Uh, this one. Mm, yeah, f with respect to the root. So that's the first step. Then we propagate the remainders down. So for example, uh, how do I compute the remainder here? It's basically this red polynomial at the parent node. We remainder it uh, with respect to the polynomial at the node, and then we get a remainder here. So let me just show the entire slide. So the rule is basically when I'm at this node, the parent remainder has already been computed. Yeah, and then we use so, yes, yes. And the divisibility, I mean, the, the second lemma sort of tells us that we are in good shape. So actually, the remainders we get here are the remainders of the top polynomial with respect to this. Uh, low degree things. But notice how the work is amortized again across the tree. At every level we basically do an order E amount of work. Of course you have to sort of use the multiplicative complexity there. But then here we have the finally the remainders and they of course are supposed to be scalars and uh, you can check that they are actually values of the of the polynomial. So notice how wonderful this is. You have this sort of algebraic uh, a possibility for recursion and evaluation based on one sort of uh, remaindering and then you pull on one further standard trick in computing namely the perfect binary tree to amortize work and, and you're done. So there's one unfortunate thing actually. So this is a little bit a space hog if you think about it because you actually have to store these polynomials when you go up so that you can go go down. Of course, I mean, if you want an extra log term, so then you can recompute as you go, but you blow up your space as well. So that's a bit unfortunate. Uh, so in practice that matters, but because to be able to do the remaindering when you go down, so you need to store the subproduct tree. So, so one good open problem is whether we could somehow save on the space complexity without increasing the time complexity. Of course, if you increase the time complexity by one further log, so then you are in linear space, basically. Okay, good. So subproduct trees have been now pictorially illustrated. So then if you want somehow the technical derivation, so that is also on the slides, but maybe we can actually 
uh, go a little bit fast through that. So, so here sort of formally how you of course do this is that you can assume that E is a power of two, I mean the number of evaluation points, and then we actually do a perfect binary tree with two to the k leaves. So I mean it's actually a relatively neat derivation if we go through it quickly. So how do you represent nodes in a in a perfect binary tree in a, in a convenient manner. So of course you use binary strings of length at most k. So that's what the underbar means there, that you basically take all the powers, uh, including an, uh, sort of up to k, and of course including the empty string as well. So that's epsilon by our notation. And then, I mean, just for a string, so let's write the I mean, string in bars for the actual length of the string. And here is, of course, ex the example for k equals 3. So you see all the, all the binary strings of length, length up to 3. Okay, so, so with this in mind, so now it's easy to start addressing a perfect binary tree. Of course, you know the, the usual trick that uh, the strings of a given length are sort of at a particular level. So the root is the empty string, and then you have the length one strings, the length two strings, and the length three strings. And now it's easy to navigate the tree because, uh, okay, and here's of course the, the node count, again, a geometric series, sort of straightforward stuff, but if you think about it, so how do we go to the parent? We just ax the last bit. So basically, that's how you go upwards in the tree. And when you want to go down, of course, you need to decide, uh, decide whether to go left or right. So you suffix the string. If you go left, it's a zero bit. If you go right, it's a one bit. So very easy to, to navigate. And if you want to formulate algorithm designs, so then you actually have now a sort of clear navigational pattern for the for the perfect binary tree. So if we want to do this in notation, actually what we did in terms of the example, so, so here it is. So now remember we have two to the k points of evaluation, let's say indexed by size of v, where v is now actually a k-bit string, if you want. So these are the polynomials at the leaves, so it's a linear polynomial as we can see, and then here is the rule how you obviously go up in the tree. So at node u, you basically take the product of whatever you have in the left child. Remember, left child was sort of suffixed with a zero, and right child suffixed with a one. And uh, <clears throat> then by induction, we can actually check, because these are monic polynomials, and I'm multiplying two monic polynomials. So the leading coefficient has to be a one in the product as well. So the product is a monic polynomial. And then, of course, we can also prove by induction that the degrees are exactly this. I mean, it sort of easy doubles at, at every level, so no rocket science. So, and, uh, and then finally, we can actually look at the remaindering if we, if we want to, how we go down the tree once we have constructed the products as per the rule below. And then, so to it's. Sorry. <clears throat> Where do we have underlying? Sorry. Yeah, in the, in the power of uh, zero. Ah, oh, right. It's uh, of length uh, up to k. Okay. So you include all the shorter lengths. Sorry, yes. That was already, I probably went through a little bit quickly, but it's all just sort of uh, mm -hmm. stating a little bit more formally what we had in the example. So, so this you can actually sort of turn into, into formal proofs if you want to. So, yeah. And then, I mean, we can actually finally show that the leaf remainders that we have are actually the evaluations in the end. So, so that's basically how fast evaluation goes. So it's a very, very little sort of a brisk exercise that <laughs> once you know how to divide fast. Ooh, probably yes, I don't have the exact original reference for you, but you can certainly find it in the textbook. Yeah, this. I think I read that it was on some paper by uh, Williams, the reference on the Yeah, 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 yeah. This is sort of really old stuff. Mm -hmm. Old stuff. So Schönhagest Rassen is also sort of 1970s, so, and this predates that. So it's certainly, I mean, uh, textbook material nowadays. Okay, good. So uh, yeah, so here's the analysis, but level-wise, um, you end up doing basically at uh, every level uh, sort of this uh, 
essentially order multiplication time E operation, so that's an upper bound for every level. And of course, there's a logarithmic number of levels, so that gives you the total complexity. And at the root, of course, you have to sort of take the remainder uh, of the input polynomial that you want to evaluate. So that's where the order D comes from, because this was the degree of the of the input. And then we had E points of evaluation. So, so that's what uh, amounts to the total complexity. Good. So now we know how to evaluate fast at arbitrary points. Then we still had one further item in the agenda, which was uh, interpolation. And then we are done with this lecture. And, and uh, this is something that I partly actually give to you and partly sort of leave for the exercises because it's highly instructive to do it for yourself. Now you see the basic template, how you work with subproduct trees. And obviously they are a more versatile tool. So you can also use them for interpolation. So let's try to see how to, how to accomplish this. So, so here is interpolation for you in, in all of its glory. So uh, we are still working over a ring, again commutative and non-trivial. And we have E points, um, basically the X coordinates and the Y coordinates, if you will, or the Xi and Eta coordinates here. And we actually insist that all the differences uh, are units in the ring. If you are working over a field, so this holds automatically, assuming that you have distinct Xi values. But this sort of also holds over, over a general ring if you just make assumptions about the x coordinates that you have, that the differences are, all pairwise differences are units, of course, of distinct uh, indices that you have. And what we would like is basically the coefficients of this polynomial, namely the Lagrange interpolation polynomial that we defined with this wonderful expression. So let's just try to parse a little bit what's what's going on in here. So this is a scalar. It's a ring element because you see only Greek letters, if you like. And this actually is uh, sort of defines the, it's a sum of a bunch of polynomials if you want to. I mean, sum of Lagrange interpolation polynomials. And if you stare at this, this polynomial form, so you see that it has roots at all the other points xi, sub j, except for the ith point. So what is its value at the ith point? So if you substitute x equals xi i here, okay, so you get a product of all the, all the differences. And if you stare at this quantity here, it is precisely those differences, inverted. So actually, uh, then the, if you will, the ith polynomial here at xi i is going to have the value 1, but then it's modulated by this uh, desired value, what we want the polynomial to actually take at xi i overall. So this means that actually this is the, the polynomial that actually has these target values at, at all the relevant i, and the degree is actually, if we stare at it carefully, so it is what at most uh, e minus 1 because we go from zero to, to e minus one and we leave one, one index out. Okay, so very good. So, so this is somehow what we need to produce. So the coefficients of this polynomial. How do we do that? Well, naively, of course, we could open this expression up and, and really just uh, do it as instructed by, by the expression, but that would not be near linear time, nowhere near. Uh, let me see. So multiplying with this, of course, you need to aggregate. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's certainly at least quadratic. But is it cubic? I mean, let me this see. part of multiplication could be done in linear time. Um, Basically, if you do it naively, then I no, think it's still quadratic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I believe you. It, it probably is doable because it's a rather sort of a structured expression. But then you still have the sum here, so then you are stuck with quadratic. That's probably. Yeah. Uh, because again, if of course you can evaluate this in linear time, 
without using fast metrics, uh, so the fast <coughs> polynomial multiplication and divisions, and then that would be, of course, an interesting result. <coughs> okay, very good. But let's uh, let's see how to how to do this. So usually, what to want to do? I mean, this looks awfully complicated. So let's do a little bit of cleaning and then sort of see whether after the cleaning we can actually get something useful done. So so let's uh, sort of. I mean, this is the form, but let's let's clean it up a little bit, shall we? So. Let's do it, do it like this, that you are just actually given some scalars <laughs> like this, and uh, then what you want to do is to just come up with the sum of, of those polynomials. And, uh, and now what I actually want to do is, is to leave most of this for you as an, as an exercise. So the problem set contains two problems, where the first problem actually uh, suggests you sort of how to do this with subproduct trees. Get this out eventually, because if you think about it, this has a rather neat form. So let's discuss this a little bit. So it's a leave one out type of game. So you basically want the product of everything, but you leave something out. So maybe you could actually do this recursively. So again, sort of assume that is conveniently a power of two, sort of to clean things up a little bit further and then think what you can do. So, so again, you want to amortize work somehow. So maybe you could compute some kind of useful subproducts again that in the end enable you to assemble these things. But of course, the difficulty is that you have these uh, lambdas here modulating the entire business. But again, what you could do, so, so let's maybe even forget about the lambdas and try to simplify things. So suppose all the lambdas are equal to, to one and then think what you could, could do. Because again, I mean, you have, let's say on the left hand side, maybe in the sort of binary tree, it happens that you are including everything and then you just on the right hand side need to leave one out in, in all possible ways. And maybe you can recurse on the leaving one out property again. And, uh, then the solution sort of starts suggesting itself to you. And you need to fix in the lambdas, but, but there is a convenient form. So whatever you actually leave out is a, one of the I mean, lambdas. So, so maybe you can actually place these monomials at the leaves and then you have the lambda uh, sort of at the missing part. And uh, you work it out then. I mean, the solution is not too difficult. And once you have this form, then actually, uh, uh, of course, we need to compute these coefficients, finally. So how do we do that fast? Let's think about it. So, yes. Oh, I see. Okay. Do you have a fresh mic? So did the mic die? Or? Oh, I see. Sorry. Okay. Very good. So let's continue. So. That was a bit of an interruption. Right, so, so maybe we could actually use the subroutine that we have built to compute these values, if you think about it. So, so again, I mean, if we have such a polynomial, so maybe we can evaluate it at relevant points. And then actually recover the coefficients that we need to. So it, it takes a couple of passes, but this is sort of the critical subroutine, plus the fast evaluation that we already built that we can use. But again, I, I don't want to give you the details because it's a contact sport. So you only learn to use these subproduct trees if you actually use them yourself. So, so that's somehow, I'm being a bit evil here, but that's, uh, that's how it goes. <clears throat> okay, so let's see whether I have anything uh, substantially further in this lecture. Okay, so uh, one thing, I mean, I, I wanted to discuss some, some applications. So I'm not sure whether you've seen a particular application of the evaluation interpolation duality. So there is a wonderful, very short paper by Adi Shamir, of course, in the communications of the ACM. I forget the precise year, but uh, this is, of course, again, standard, maybe textbook material that you see in cryptographic courses, but since we're discussing the evaluation interpolation duality, 
and batch evaluation and interpolation. So maybe it pays off to um, spend the spend the uh, remaining 15 minutes uh, by having a little bit of fun with this particular application. Just to recall it in case you maybe haven't seen it. Again, this is not critical for the rest of the material to follow, but let's take a minor, minor detour. Okay, so, so here basically, if you read it, so there's basically uh, part of the abstract of the paper. So in this paper, we show how to divide a piece of data D into n pieces in such a way that D is easily reconstructable from any k pieces, but even complete knowledge of k minus one of the pieces reveals no information about D. This technique enables the construction of uh, yeah, yeah, and, and so forth, and basically secret sharing schemes, key management in crypto and, and whatnot. Okay, so, so here's a question to you that sort of already spoils the key idea how to use evaluation interpolation to, to share a secret. So, so let's work with the, an easy case. So let's work over a finite field, take uh, let's say the integers modulo a prime for your favorite prime. And uh, let's look at uh, basically a line, a linear polynomial. Basically a polynomial of degree at most one. So I ask you the question, so, so how much we actually know about the constant of the line if we know the value of the line for a non-zero point? Well, we don't know much. It's over a finite field, so Basically, we have no knowledge whatsoever what the constant is, because the line could go anywhere. Okay, that seems to be a useful thing if you want to share a secret somehow. One point on a line doesn't reveal anything, but of course if you know two points on the line, then we can of course recover the sort of equality and, and so forth. I mean the identity of the line and get the constant. So this seems to have this threshold phenomenon that k minus one pieces do not suffice and any k pieces will be just fine to recover the secret. So more generally, of course, if I have a, let's say, degree at most d polynomial, and uh, again, I know evaluations at non-zero points, let's say, d of them, so how much I actually know about the, the constant then. And again, unfortunately, the, I mean, d plus one points will suffice, then you know everything, but d points, not so much. Okay, so let's try to see this in a little bit more, more detail. So, so here is maybe, maybe a more detailed derivation of, of this, that you don't actually know, know anything. Uh, if you just know, know the points, because if you stare at the, the Van der Bond matrix, and again, we have been careful to, to really look at the evaluation at, at zero. So that is, of course, by definition, the, the sort of constant of the, of the polynomial. And if you think about it, why is it the case that we don't know anything if we know evaluations at d, d non-zero points is, is basically that we have this identity that the evaluation at, at xi zero, which is zero, is the constant. So, so if I just know these things, so then uh, in principle what, what I hid there, so if these have been chosen at random, so I, I really don't know anything about the secret because of this. So the secret, uh, this is what I want to hide into, into shares so I can produce evaluations at non-zero points and I need d plus one shares of the, of the secret to, to recover. Okay, so yet another useful application of uh, evaluation interpolation. Yes? Just to, to clarify, it seems to be clear but, but still Mm. So, so this is fundamental that actually uh, the evaluation at zero only touches yeah. the constant. Uh, if, if you means that if we know uh, the values of this polynomial. Yeah, if we know, let's say, d shares. Yeah. So then uh, we so still we cannot reveal any information about, about but because this choose this arbitrarily, basically. Well, we still, we, we might reveal some information about other coefficients. Right. Yes. So, I mean, yeah. 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 It it's, it's a bit subtle. It's a bit subtle. So, but really, this property of the zero evaluation yeah. is is critical. That you don't reveal anything about the constant by looking at 
at this, mm -hmm. because essentially you can choose the constant still arbitrarily and you still have a unique solution. Yeah, you are asking a very good question, so it's a, it's a bit subtle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, good. Um, so again, just to state this. Uh, so basically, if we know at most d evaluations at non-zero points, we know nothing about the constant, but as soon as we know d plus one or more, then we know everything by interpolation. And what is nice, now we have extremely fast algorithms for doing these things. So you could quite literally distribute a secret to the entire population of a country and uh, then sort of, uh, let's say at least half the people in the country need to agree to reveal things and then, then you can reveal. But otherwise, even if there's a off by one, so no luck. <laughs> so it's, uh, I mean, given the fast algorithms in particular, so this is a rather neat tool. Of course, it has, multi I mean, this is just the first result in a sort of extensive body of research on, on secret sharing schemes. So, but it's a nice application of evaluation and interpolation. And then here is sort of if you want to spell things out in detail. So again, sort of how to apply this. So you actually choose uh, the other coefficients uniformly at, at random. And of course, I mean, the constant is the thing that you want to hide and you are careful to choose. I mean, you, if you want to produce S shares of the secret, so you choose distinct non-zero points, one point for each, each share. And then you, of course, form the polynomial, uh, produce the batch evaluation. So, of course, you can reveal, I mean, always the x-coordinate and, and what is the corresponding share. Um, and then, then you have these things and sort of both construction and recovery are, are fast operations for sort of really large parameters, if you, if you like. And this sort of is also a nice motivation for some of the things that, that follow. So if you think about what we just did, so we use the evaluation interpolation duality to distribute information. So somehow the secret got uh, spread over uniformly across the shares and we have this wonderful thresholding phenomenon that you need a particular number of shares, otherwise you, you know nothing. And we also used actually randomization. So you pick the other coefficients uh, uniformly at, at random and the constant is the is the secret. So, so this type of sort of randomizing the evaluation interpolation duality will also play a role. I mean, once we start looking at these probabilistically checkable proofs later today. And of course, it's also a key ingredient in polynomial identity testing that uh, is also, also a fundamental technique. So again, sort of evaluation interpolation duality is, is extremely important in terms of algorithm design. So uh, I think I'm running a little bit ahead of time, so we would still have about five minutes before the break, but let me just uh, sum things up. So, so this was lecture three, so 45 plus 45. So what did we do? Well, we initially knew how to multiply, so now we know how to divide. And again, lots of useful techniques. So reversal, Newton iteration, convergence analysis for the Newton iteration. So I didn't show you in detail how this goes in the integer case, but uh, it is a very instructive exercise to study also the large integer arithmetic algorithms in parallel to, to the polynomial algorithms. So, so yes. This convergence analysis just says that like log iterations are sufficient. Yes, indeed. And for the integer case, it's sort of similar that you double the precision basically that you have at every, every step for the multiplicative inverse of your rational number that you represent the radix point. But this is not something we will look at in detail. Uh, in this course. Okay, and then I mean, once we knew how to divide, so then we actually put that into action using some fundamental techniques like recursion and, and, and how you sort of go up and down a perfect binary tree to amortize work. And uh, then we saw one amusing example of, uh, of this uh, in the context of secret sharing. So, so basically that we can use the fast algorithms to, to split a secret, uh, let's say, among a massive population if we want. So. It's a neat technique to, to have in the bag, and it was also our first sort of serious encounter with randomization during this course. Now that we can sort of by putting random noise to the other coefficients besides the secret, we can hide the 
secret that you can basically do no better than just to guess what the secret is actually there's no information at all if you hold uh, too few shares for recovery okay so that is about it so did you have a question also no okay so then there's the problem set as usual yeah, yes So in this secret sharing protocol, mm. once again, I mean we we select the coefficients of the polynomial randomly. Mm. So if if we don't do this, if we just fix them to I mean, to some particular constant. Mm. Yeah, so for example, if you set all of this to zero, that yeah, is... Yeah, some constants that... Uh, mm. if, if, if it is me who is going to... Uh, I mean, mm. and I think some, some constants that I somehow select, I don't know, probably not randomly, but... Mm. These are just my favorite constants. So what, what, what happens then? Uh, it is still true that by knowing k minus one shares well, the mm. part is. So mm. if you know the values of your dots that you are going to calculate, you know this coefficients. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, so indeed a good idea to think about this. So suppose these are all zeros. I mean, the, Higher yeah. things. So then, of course, all of your shares are equal to the secret. Right. And that is. Indeed. No, no, I mean, mm. if, if nobody knows the coefficients, but they are not random. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But in here, of course, if you, let's say, fix some, some values for the, for the coefficients, so then it's sort right. of. Uh, becomes a question of basically how much you you know. So then it gets a little bit, yeah. It's not quite, I mean, it's, it's not like solving a, because you, okay, you know the right-hand sides indeed, uh, but then the question is what, what do you know about the, the shares at that point? If, if you know something about the coefficients, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So I haven't really, really thought about it in, in that way, but certainly, I mean, if you let's say set these guys to zero, so then we are surely in trouble right. already. So, mm -hmm. so this would suggest that, of course, if we have some further knowledge about the coefficients, then then you land in in trouble more generally. Okay, as well. so, so like the formal claim is when we select p one p d at random, then mm -hmm. yeah. So the and kind of the probability that we have a fixed zero is... Yeah, I mean, so here is sort of what, what you want to show in that case. So it's really spelled out in here. So now basically you, you get a collection of shares. Right. So that collection of shares is consistent actually with exactly yeah. one choice of the coefficients. Yeah. And now, of course, if these have been chosen uniformly at random, so you could just as well right. do as guess. But it, it's a bit subtle argument, as I said. Right. So, But this is really the... So there is always a unique choice for, for any, any D shares that you might have. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you have no knowledge of these guys, so then, yeah, you could just as well guess the secret. Mm -hmm. But if you do have knowledge, then watch out. Yeah. 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 A very good question. Here you assume that zero to zero is one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's tacit. Yes. In, of course. I mean, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so let's see, I was about to wrap up. So indeed, here was the recap. And then again, there is a problem set that I can quickly flash, but now the slides are online. So you notice, I mean, you have sort of the fast interpolation spelled out for you here. Uh, lots of hints. So you see there's even the sort of subproduct thing that I would like you to construct. So again, you may choose not to look at the hint in case you want to really sort of uh, do a little bit more work and then there's finally how to do the Lagrange interpolation. So it's all spelled out in here, but again, it's a contact sport. So I encourage you to play ball a little and uh, solve this. 
And okay, so then uh, for the next lecture, so we actually go into the extended Euclidean algorithm, how to actually do it in near linear time and uh, interpolation from data that actually has a bit of errors. But this is uh, after the break.